And I'm pleased to be joined today by Vincent Delisle. He is the head of liquid markets for CDPQ. It's one of the largest institutional managers in Canada and the largest in Quebec uh, with a total portfolio of more than $300 billion. And we're very glad to have you today. Uh, welcome. Glad to be here. Um, maybe you could just start by giving the audience uh, a, a bit of an overview of, of, of what you do, what falls under your responsibility at uh, the most important pension fund in Quebec. Absolutely. So as you just mentioned in the introduction, Caisse de Pôle, um, has about uh, 300 billion um, of assets under management, U.S. dollars, so it's 400 uh, billion in Canadian dollars. Uh, I am in charge of our fixed income strategies, fixed income portfolios, both public and private fixed income uh, investments, as well as our public equity uh, investments. In total, that's about uh, two thirds of the assets under management at, uh, at the case. Um, when we were uh, discussing beforehand, you talked about uh, your DNA as an investor being uh, one of a focus on long-term quality companies. Can you just uh, talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. One, one of the main advantages for, for pension funds, um, and, and one that we feel very strongly about, is the, uh, the advantage, the opportunity to be there for the long term. So as long-term investors, you're less sensitive to short-term um, moves in the market, short-term volatilities. And, and what we find is sticking to um, fundamental processes, looking at quality companies that are there for the long-term uh, as, uh, as some, uh, some great benefits for our performance, it reduces volatility as well. So our clients are happy with that. Uh, and that's one of the uh, that's one of the pillars of our strategy at uh, at Casa de Pool. Now, on the fixed income side, uh, there's been a, a almost a revolution in how you guys have managed that portfolio over over a number of years, uh, uh, switching much more to to private lending uh, and. Uh, the public part of the public part of that portfolio has gotten much smaller. Um, can you um, tell us more about that? Walk us through that evolution and 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 why it happened. Well, yes, you're right. You know the the, the fixed income portfolio uh, evolved significantly um, four years ago, going from pretty much all public. Uh, 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 sovereigns in the in the book to more of a an increased exposure to to private to private credit. Private credit offers um, um, higher coupons. So in an environment where interest rates are moving lower, uh, we find that this was a, a good evolution to to embark on. Um, we still have uh, a significant uh, size in in sovereign bonds as well. Provides liquidity, agility. Uh, uh, enables us to tactically uh, reorient our, our, our positioning, but the increase in private credit that we're doing it through through uh, various fields as well, you know, real estate lending, we're doing it into uh, uh, emerging market sovereign sovereign debt, uh, um, uh, investment grade and, and high grade. The, the advantage of being around the table, dictating uh, the terms of, uh, of some of those uh, some of those deals also is quite appealing to us, um, and it's it's seen an increasing amount of exposure in our portfolio over the last uh, since 2016. Uh, it's also a space that's becoming uh, more and more competitive as as other large institutions um, jump into that. Um, what are you seeing in 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 the competitive landscape on? Private loans when you're you know when you're when you're competing for business, what's the uh, what's the competition level like at the moment? The competition is it's pretty uh, it's pretty heavy. You know we're living in uh, we're all dealing with an environment where interest rates are very very low. So the chase for yield, the hunt for yield, is is everywhere. Not only in our fixed income uh, portfolios, but uh, a lot of competition and and. You know, one one of the things we mentioned that you know the first question you asked me or the second question you asked me, you know, the quality the quality aspect of why we'll want to lend or why we'll want to invest um, is is something that uh, we're we're reminded of right now as there's competition for 
for deals for, for, for lending with spreads near you know record lows uh, as well. So it, it is a very highly competitive um, market right now. Other pension funds are uh, have a have similar strategies of going into the, uh, the the private market. So it's relationship. It's making sure we get access to uh, to tremendous opportunities, but also being disciplined and patient. Uh, let's talk about the macro environment uh, because in 18 months or so we've we've gone from uh, uh, the great disruption of the pandemic uh, to uh, uh, the sort of frenetic recovery that uh, that that took place that has uh, created in in credits almost at times euphoric conditions uh, or certainly very robust conditions. Uh, where do you think we are in you know in the cycle? Um, you're right. The, the, this crisis has been um, very peculiar in terms of what triggered it, um, a pandemic. It's also been uh, quite abnormal uh, when you look at the extent to which uh, governments and central banks have stepped in to, to uh, inject liquidity and make sure that the economy would, A, survive the great disruption, as you, as you said, but also uh, recover. Um, what we find is that we're seeing this cycle play out much, much faster than um, other uh, other rebounds from recession. Certainly, when you compare it to the 07, 08, 09 financial crisis, the recovery has been much more robust, very, very fast. And we find ourselves, um, you know, a year, 12 to 15 months after the start of COVID at the spring of 2020. And we think the early phase, the early cycle phase is starting to peak out and we're starting to see some mid cycle signs. Central banks are talking about their next steps, which will be normalizing monetary policy, whether it's the Bank of Canada or the Federal Reserve. Uh, the Bank of Canada already, already talking about tapering uh, its, its QE strategy, the Fed, about to head that way as well um, um, next year. And this is all happening in the context where valuations in equity markets, valuations and credits are at very lofty levels. And the pace of their recovery, we expect will moderate um, in the next few months. So it's only been a year since this recession um, ended. It feels more mid-cycle than early cycle, in our opinion. It's only been a year, but in some ways, it feels like a lifetime. Uh, uh, the last, uh, the last eighteen months. Um, uh, so, so continuing on that theme, then um, uh, central banks are starting to talk about the next step. What are the indicators or signals that you are watching most closely to um, to gauge when they're going to start stop talking and start taking some action that would. Uh, kind of change the landscape for fixed income investors. Yeah, well, we're, we're taking our cue from when central banks, um, what central banks are looking at uh, right now. So I apologize for the answer, but when you look at the Bank of Canada, it seems like the playbook for the Bank of Canada to normalize monetary policy is is hinged on similar factors from the past: the output gap, the inflation numbers. When you look south of the border in the U.S., um, the Federal Reserve is talking about making sure there's an inclusive recovery. Um, and for us, that certainly means looking at the employment, the employment numbers. Uh, so the recovery has been uneven globally. Um, the U.S. has been doing better than, uh, than other regions. Canada is doing very well uh, also. In, in our view, when employment gains, when employment levels are back, to pre-pandemic um, levels, then the tone from central banks will certainly start to hinge on a, being more uh, more of a neutral stance. Key to that is how transit transitory are the inflation numbers. The big debate out there is we're you know we're looking at inflation data in the U.S. and Canada that none of us have seen in our lifetimes. Central banks believe this is transitory. Um, if we're still talking about transitory a year from now, we could have some issues as to how quickly some central banks need to, to react. But the timing is still debatable, obviously. The next step, less so. So you're going from you know emergency monetary policy that is 
looking less and less warranted. How will markets react when rates start to gradually move higher? Um, as I said earlier, with valuations at already very steep levels, the risk of disappointment, which you typically see mid-cycle, the risk of disappointment uh, is increasingly visible in our view. Are, are you on team transitory when it comes to the inflation debate? Um, when you when you look at the 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 effects on you know yes we are on team transitory. Um, team transitory doesn't necessarily mean rates stay at zero. However, and I think that's a very important caveat here. Um, we don't need to go back to 1970 type inflation numbers for rates. When you look at uh, at the level of real interest rates right now, where it's are at record lows, still the risk um, of uh, of inflation numbers uh, bringing a more balanced view from central banks certainly push points towards uh, yields uh, reverting uh, a tad higher. You mentioned a couple of times, you know, lofty valuations. You know, we we see that in both in both uh, equities and. Uh, and parts of the credit market, certainly, uh, the risk of disappointment. Uh, how is La uh, uh positioning itself or trying to protect itself or manage its risk in light of those factors, uh, those circumstances? Yeah, well, you know, keep in mind, mid-cycle doesn't mean the end of the cycle. It does, in, in our opinion, bring an environment where the risk-reward outlook is more balanced for risk risk assets. Um, risk, riskier assets tend to shine and outperform the most coming off recessions in the early innings of, of rebound. So from, from our point of view, um, the metrics we look at, the indicators we look at, uh, have been indicating in recent months a more balanced risk reward outlook for, for credit, for, for, for cyclicals, for, for equities. We had a uh, much more of a pro-risk positioning in our fixed income portfolios and our equity strategies um, in 2021. And since, uh, since uh, May and June, we have been slowly paring back our risk levels. So we're, I, I consider, I'd say we're more neutral in terms of, uh, of, of positioning currently, which would correlate uh, and be according to our view of mid-cycle conditions. If you had to look out two to three years on the fixed income side, uh, of the portfolio, where do you uh, see most likely the case putting uh, more resources, uh, more uh, more brain power, more talent? Where do you see the growth? Um, private credit is definitely so. As you as you alluded to in the introduction, private credit in our fixed income portfolio has grown has grown from you know non-existent in 2016 to uh, to significant portion today. That's still where. We are looking, uh, looking to grow, uh, and uh, so we need, we, you know, manpower, brain power, uh, including data in the way we uh, we uh, we we run the portfolio as well. That's definitely one of the areas. Uh, you know, real assets and private credit on the fixed income side is is where we're looking to increase uh, our our presence. Um, for patients, uh, you know, valuations are somewhat of a challenge right now. The competition for, for deals is uh, is a challenge, but our uh, our objective, we know where we're heading, and that's more exposure to to private credit, and that's definitely the the area of growth for us at uh, at La Case. Mm. Uh, we were we were speaking to your CEO, in fact, earlier today, uh, and he talked about uh, at some length about the. Uh, importance of technology, both as an investment theme, uh, but also in the way that you guys operate. And he, he spoke uh, about needing different kinds of, of uh, talent, skills, uh, degrees within the investment group. Um, you know, there's a lot of change going on in the case. Can you just sort of speak to that, to the to the people side of of portfolio management? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the technology is not only Technology companies or stocks that you can put in the in the portfolio, they get all the the attention. But technology, data science, 
uh, in, 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 in processes and the way you can construct, one can construct a portfolio is definitely one area that uh, we feel very, very fond of. And, and we see it having an impact in, in all of our strategies, not only in public markets, public bonds, but also whole investment monitoring and private equity and in, in infrastructure as well. So that means looking for a skill set that complements what we've been doing well for a long time, uh, mixing you know, finance degrees with economics degrees, with math skills, with computer skills, um, our, our DNA in, 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 quality, in finding quality companies, uh, long-term approach, obviously caters to, to bottom-up fundamental analysis. We want now to integrate some, uh, some quantitative systematic uh, tools that help us optimize the way we construct the, um, the, the portfolio. So technology is, is certainly one of the, the key areas of focus for, uh, for our CEO, for myself, for the executive committee, for every employee here at the case. So it means, you know, our hiring, uh, our hiring uh, uh, objectives and how we want to complement our investment processes. Another focus for the uh, for the fund is is ESG, and um, and I know they 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 will be speaking more about new targets in the uh, in the days ahead. Um, it, it's sort of easy to think about ESG as well, you know, divest dirty industries, but of course it has to be a lot more than that. Um, how does ES how does ESG work its way into your own evaluation of private credit deals, for example? Yeah, well, you're right. ESG is not uh, simply avoiding areas or companies that you don't want in the portfolios. It's uh, it's taking a stand, accompanying companies that are invest, you know, that we're invested in, and helping them in the um, in the transition. So whether it's on the fixed income portfolio where we're analyzing lending money to a company or an industry, or it's on the uh, on, on the equity side, we have criterias, we have uh, you know filtering processes that help us identify you know if we're going to give a green light or a red light to a to an investment. But there's also the post investment um, accompaniment of investments that we have already made, where we can um, help these companies through this uh, through this uh, transition. So it's it's environment, it's social, it, it's governance issues, and it's uh, it's it's front and, front and center for uh, for all the employees here at, uh, at the case. And that's one area we can also use technology to to assess to monitor the investments that we're making, filtering processes as well and, and keep track of uh, of where the improvements are back tests how companies are doing those that are showing improvements are they performing better so it's 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 e it's s it's, it's g but it's also getting included in in, in in how we want our processes to to evolve whether it's credit or uh, or equities what's the biggest risk you think the markets are underrating right now well, there's a there's a lot of confidence in the market right now that um, that interest rates will continuously be a tailwind. Um, low interest rates uh, cater to, you know, loftier valuations, um, valuation multiples expanding, and that's really what we've seen pre-COVID and since the recovery um, last year. And the absence the absence of uh, of normalization from monetary policy, the expectations that stimulus can continue forever uh, is feeding into some complacency uh, and overly optimistic uh, level of inflows and expectations in the in the market. So I, I'd say the the easy answer, the obvious answer, is uh, when interest rates stop being such of a, a tailwind, that will certainly. Um, uh, bring some uh, some more volatility in in the markets right now. 